uh, presentation. As most of you know, uh, normally in a normal quarterly meeting in Fort Mason, we would have a presentation along with rounds of readings and um, we'd have some kind of workshop and things. But now we're gonna, for a while into the future, we're just going to um, have the presentation separately. So when we have our quarterly meetings, um, they'll be more devoted to a featured reader, some rounds of readings and business and news and sharing of awards and books and publications and things. And then we're just gonna take the presentations and we're gonna break them out separately. And so that's what this is. This is our first breakout separate presentation. Um, and before you too far, just let me tell you, we're gonna have another meeting October 25th. That's our fall meeting. And Renee Owen will be our featured reader. Um, we're gonna have another breakout presentation in November. Uh, I don't think we've actually nailed down the date. And we have a presenter, but we haven't, we haven't put all the details together yet. And we'll give you a separate announcement when we have all that worked out for you, but that, that's probably November. And then our next meeting will be in January 24, 2021. And again, it'll be a Zoom meeting like this one. And then moving forward beyond that, there'll be more presentations, but we haven't picked dates or picked presenters. So if you all have interest in giving a presentation, you can send me or Sue or Carolyn or Paul Miller, any of the officers, your ideas for a presentation and let it, run it by us and we'll see if we can work it into the program somehow. Um, so let's get started. So today um, we have uh, Philip Kennedy. Kennedy, he's, he's a member of the Yuki Teki Haiku Society and the Haiku Society of America. He's also a member of the Ten Haiku Society, I'm saying that wrong, Ten, Ten Haiku Society in Japan. He's been writing English language haiku since 2012 and Japanese language haiku since 2018. When he's not writing haiku, he works in educational publishing for National Geographic Learning. And now here's our presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see my, hmm. I tried sharing my screen and there's a note that the host disabled attendee screen sharing. Hmm, I'm not sure uh, how to actually uh, fix that. Well, in the worst case scenario, we can send it to Sue and Sue Wait, can- try again, it. try again. Ah, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, uh, I need to quit back out. Uh, I've just installed Zoom on this other uh, computer and in order to share my screen, I need to leave the meeting and rejoin. So I'll be right back. My, my sincere apologies about this. Okay, so Sue, can you tell us about the contest we have coming up? Deadline coming up for that? Yeah, so we have um, the Haiku, Senryu, and Tonka contest deadline, October 31st. You can submit the same way you've always submitted, or you can, for the first time ever, you can submit online. The instructions are on the website and in the last newsletter. Great. So, and then Renge is a January 31st deadline. And for anyone who submitted to the Gary Gay <laughs> official uh, HSA, Renge contest, send those to HPNC. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm back and uh, hopefully uh, everybody can see my uh, the, the, the presentation. Looks great. I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Thank you. So uh, just as a, a way of uh, introducing myself a, a little bit, I want to say that uh, I am a very much an amateur at this. I'm uh, not an academic. Uh, I've been studying Japanese for about 20 years, and uh, I've been uh, writing a little haiku for, uh, in Japanese for a much smaller part of that uh, time. 
as an English language haiku poet and a Japanese uh, language, uh, the beginning of uh, a haiku writer, uh, I frequently come across things in the Japanese language sources that I'm reading that I really want to share with people because in, uh, we don't have access to a, a lot of good translations of, uh, of what's produced by the haiku world in Japan. So uh, every so often when I see something that uh, really sparks my interest, uh, I like to share it with people. So this isn't necessarily an academic presentation, but it's something that comes out of my own experience uh, learning about and using uh, the, the Japanese uh, the season words. And this is also my first presentation to a group other than Yuki Teike. So uh, if I seem a bit nervous, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll calm down. Thank you for So th th thank you for bearing with this. Uh, I've uh, posted just a very brief uh, outline slide of uh, detailing uh, what I want to talk about. Uh, I want to say a few things about what uh, a season word is. And most of you probably know this already, but I just wanted to uh, define these terms uh, as they would be understood by mainstream traditional Japanese haiku or by uh, the English language of the haiku groups that are, are trying to write traditional Japanese uh, inspired uh, haiku. I also want to introduce two framing ideas that I'll talk about uh, uh, more uh, later that in Japanese traditional poetics, some seasons are more poetic than others. I mean, you can write poetry about any season, then any season itself can be poetic, but the uh, greater tradition that goes back into uh, the, the, the court poetry and waka tends to value some seasons a little more than others. The second framing idea I want to introduce that I want you to uh, the, the, the keep in mind as we move forward is seasons and writing about seasons is not just a literary activity. I mean, we live our lives in the seasons and that does have an effect on how we write and how the tools that we use to write with are shaped. So that's all prefatory. And then I want to look at some interesting distribution patterns of Japanese language season words uh, that are about how seasons end when you move from one season to the next. And uh, the patterns are very traditional. Uh, there are new developments that I'll also talk about, but those patterns reflect people's lived experiences, and I think they also reflect the, uh, the, the Japanese poetic tradition's understanding of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, poetry of the different seasons. So just a few season word basics, and again, uh, if you know this already, uh, my apologies, I just want to go through this a little quickly. A traditional Japanese haiku theoretically should contain only one season word. The word for season word in Japanese is kigo, ki for season and go for word. And I'm not really talking about the, the, the various uh, specific uses of a single kigo or multiple kigo. You will find haiku in Japanese uh, and in English that contain multiple season words. There are usually reasons for that, but I'm approaching this from uh, just to give some structure to the presentation from a beginner's perspective. And beginners are always uh, uh, cautioned and encouraged to use one season word per haiku. And the reason is season words are extremely powerful little things. I mean, if you think about how small the haiku form is, you need something to turn that into real poetry. And for a traditional uh, Japanese uh, haiku, the season word is a major part of turning uh, an utterance into haiku into poetry. A season word can be the focus for the emotions or feelings in a poem. A season word, if you are familiar with, the more familiar you become with haiku, a season word makes the verse experientially larger. So there's a good example of this from a beginner's book by a 20th century uh, famous, uh, great uh, haiku uh, poet in Japan, Fujita Shoshi, and uh, in a discussion of uh, how season words actually work in a poem is that he cites uh, a commentary by uh, another great Japanese haiku poet of the 20th century, Mizuhara Shuoshi, talking about uh, a famous haiku by Takahama Kyoshi. And in Japanese, uh, the haiku uh, runs, Toyama ni hino atari taru kare no kana. And in English, it's something like, the light of the sun hits the distant mountains, withered field. The light of the sun hits the distant mountains, withered field. 
And uh, in this discussion, uh, Shuo, she points out uh, that that one season word, withered field, which is a winter season word, encapsulates so much that if you are familiar with the system, that will tell you what is the quality of the light that's falling on the distant hills. What kind of uh, the, the, the plants are the, still there in the withered field or are left? What does that withered field look like? If there's a nearby hill, is there a village at the, the base of the hill? It helps you fill in the details and it takes a, a, a very, very uh, constrained set of words and makes it into something much bigger. So this isn't something that I'm talking about specifically now, but it's something to be aware of that season words have this kind of very powerful sense that helps you unpack a poem. I also want to mention that season words aren't just static labels. I mean, they are very complex literary objects. And in addition to the meaning that a season word has. So for withered field, it talks about the state of a field that normally is flourishing in the other seasons that is full of withered and uh, decayed uh, vegetation in the winter. But that season word also has a literary history, uh, the how other people who have written in haiku have used that season word in their haiku. For some season words, that literary history extends into Japanese traditional waka, so even further back in time before the development of a linked uh, verse even. Some season words have an even deeper history and go back to uh, the classical Chinese poetry. So there is a very, very long historical dimension to most season words. There are also wider cultural connotations. You can think of the, the season word for the Halloween in English that doesn't just represent the festival. There's all sorts of other stuff that gets brought into Halloween culturally for us. And lastly, with a season word, you also have a personal connection with that season word. Otherwise, you can't write about it. So these are very small, but very active and very complex literary objects. As part of that, and the uh, image here is uh, just a, a photograph of uh, what a saijiki page uh, looks like from uh, one of uh, the Japanese uh, uh, comprehensive saijiki. A saijiki is a season word almanac where you find season words. So just uh, this is what it actually looks like. This is where you get them. Uh, season words don't exist as isolated data points. And again, you can think, well, there's a bunch of, there's a collection of season words. That's what a saijiki or a season word almanac is. But those season words stand in relation to other season words. Uh, at a very basic level, any given season word is related to the season that it belongs to, uh, which itself is a season word. Uh, season words can also uh, have a relationships with season words across seasons, and you can have multiple season words or seasonal expressions within a single season talking about the same phenomenon, but with different nuances. So when you look at it together, I mean, season words were not created like this. They have evolved like this since the first lists of kinokotoba or the words for seasons for linked verse started to be uh, written down in the 1500s. You can view the totality of the season words in current use as a very complex interrelated semiotic system which is really cool, but what it means if you are a Western beginner, somebody who is not Japanese, who did not grow up in Japan, uh, who came to an appreciation of Japanese culture uh, later in life, uh, how are you gonna learn this? <laughs> I mean, this is, a, the, this is an amazing system, but where do you start? And one of the things that I've learned as a Western beginner if I really want to understand a season word, I need to look at related season words to that season word and learn about them all. That will tell me what the differences are between parallel season words, uh, where season words appear in other seasons, where they don't appear, how season words in the same season about the same uh, ostensible phenomena differ. So this is one of the reasons why I really, really like reading about season words. They're, they're, they're so rich, there's so much depth there. And uh, I wish more of this was available to uh, people in English in the West. So this is why I want to share this with people. So the, just as a very quickly, one of the ideas that uh, I want to have the people aware of as we proceed through the main part of this uh, presentation, I mentioned before that traditional Japanese literary culture considers some seasons more poetic than others. And uh, if you uh, haven't seen this uh, before, among spring, summer, autumn, and winter, spring and autumn are viewed by the tradition as 
more poetic. And you can see this in a number of ways. So if you look at the, uh, the imperial poetry anthologies uh, that uh, started with the uh, Kokinshu in the, uh, the early 900s, and uh, continued uh, through into the, uh, I think the 13 or 1400s, you will find that the vast majority of them contain more books of poetry for spring and autumn than winter. So for the Kokinshu, which was uh, the, the circa 900, the first of the Heian anthologies, and the Shin Kokinshu, which was uh, the circa 1200, spring has two books of poems, autumn has two books of poems, summer has one book of poems, winter has one book of poems, and these are the large uh, collections. And as you move forward in time, uh, autumn is actually a little more important than spring. So in the Shinko Kinshu, there are way, far, far more autumn poems than there are spring. This is something that's very deeply rooted in the Japanese poetic tradition. And I want to kind of uh, step even a little further back to the, uh, the era of the Manyoshu. That was the first great anthology of poetry in Japan. It dates to the Nara period, so mid eighth century, I think 750 or so. And it contains poems from the Nara period and uh, the earlier. Uh, the, uh, the earliest poem that really looks at the valuation of Seasons was written or attributed to Princess Nukata, who was an imperial princess whose dates we think are 630 to 690. So this is really, really, really early. And it's a, it's a, it starts a topos in a Japanese a literary a history called Shunju no Yuretsu, or the merits of spring and autumn. You have a poet comparing the two seasons. So I'm just going to turn to this very quickly. This is a little off topic, but I do want to share this with you to uh, give you a sense of how uh, deeply rooted some of these perceptions are. I've included the uh, original, well, the uh, modern Japanese transcription uh, into a little, uh, a little modern in Japanese uh, uh, the, the writing of the uh, Manyogana and the Manyoshu. I have the, uh, the Uromaji too, but to save time, I'm just going to read my uh, relatively uh, workman-like translation of the poem, just so that you, just so that you have a sense of uh, what's actually being talked about. When spring arrives after a long hibernation, the birds that have not been singing, sorry, I'm having some screen issues, apologies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When spring arrives after a long hibernation, the birds that have not been singing arrive and sing again. The flowers that have not been blooming start to bloom. But because the hills are overgrown, even if you reach them, you can't pick flowers. Because the grasses are so deep, even if you pull them up, you still can't see. But autumn mountains, when you see their colored leaves, you cherish their beauty. The leaves that are still green, you lament and leave in place. What a pity. For me, it must be the mountains of autumn. So here, Princess Nukata is uh, essentially uh, preferring autumn over spring uh, because it's easier to actually pick the colored leaves and take them back with you uh, than it is to uh, pick the branches of flowers on the trees that are currently blooming. It's, it's a little facetious because it's not necessarily about the beauty as much as it's about the accessibility of, of, of the, the taking the stuff home with you. But still, it's a, a very early example of this evaluation of springs and autumns. Note that summer and winter are not involved in this at all. So the last framing idea I want to uh, uh, leave you with that should be uh, that you should think about as we're uh, going forward is that seasons are also lived experiences. So our evaluation of the seasons aren't just from this literary uh, the, the poetic uh, sense, but are also from uh, our own actual experience. Uh, and traditionally, and I say traditionally because uh, these conceptions come out of a pre-modern agricultural society. No air conditioning, no winter sports, no real summer sports, uh, no reliable central heating. So winter is a harsh season of extreme cold. I mean, it, it still is today. Life is dormant in winter. It's a quiet season, not quiet in a good way. 
spring represents a relief from the cold. It's a rebirth. The 10,000 things come into being again uh, in spring. Uh, the beauty returns. Uh, but then we transition to summer, which is another season of extremes. We have the tsu, or the long rainy season of just uh, the unstoppable rain, followed by extreme heat. And that extreme heat continues into autumn, but autumn promises a relief from the heat. And it's also a very quiet intermission before the arrival of winter. So there, there are a lot of sort of uh, the, the, the bittersweet or melancholy feelings attached with that because of the, the autumn coming as a relief of summer, but you know, we all know winter is still coming. So I'm going to stop here for a moment to ask people if uh, there are any questions. That's our uh, the cat, Urara, who's uh, currently sleeping just as uh, something to uh, distract us from season words for a moment. So uh, I can take questions for a couple minutes and then we can get back to the presentation if that's okay. Great, so feel free to unmute yourself if, if anyone has a question and then just mute yourself back again after. Philip, it's Thomas John here. Are there collections of poetry uh, that focus on just using the same season word over and over where you'd read like 50 or 100 poems that would use the same season word so we could kind of catch that feel or is that something that's been done at all? And your the presentation's great. Half the people here are from Yuki. Thank you. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, in, in terms of collections of season words, uh, you, you have the Saijiki, and the Saijiki generally are either uh, one volume things that talk about uh, all the seasons and all the season words, uh, or you have uh, individual volume Saijiki, uh, which talk about a single of uh, the season and its season words. Uh, but as far as I know, there aren't any collections of just, say, of uh, something like Akikaze, uh, the autumn wind, and uh, a bunch of uh, the poems are uh, just about autumn wind. I could be wrong because as I am a beginner and there are still uh, uh, places that are uh, the relatively uh, the, the fuzzy uh, in terms of my understanding, but I'm not sure that there are season word specific collections. Thank Hello, you. this is uh, Johnny. I have a question about the Japanese Sajikis. So you gave the example of withered fields as mm -hmm. a as a kigo, but what would be on the page with it? Would it have anything to do with the season, or would it be more associated with uh, fields or? Ah, well, uh, the way uh, uh, most uh, saijiki are. <laughs> Uh, organized, uh, they firstly go by season. Uh, and uh, within the season, uh, there are usually separate sections. So in the most Saijiki, you will have a section for uh, the, the times of the season and calendrical stuff. And in that initial section, you'll have things like the beginning of the season, the end of the season, uh, the important uh, the seasonal periods like uh, the early autumn, mid autumn, late autumn, and so on. You'll have uh, times of the day like uh, the, the autumn dusk uh, in this, uh, that first one. The second uh, the, uh, category that you'll, uh, the second category that you see in uh, the Saijiki is generally uh, weather, atmospherical, and astronomical things. So uh, everything from the sun and stars to clouds and weather. Then you'll have a section called seikatsu that refers to the human affairs daily life. Things like sunglasses or uh, the soda water in the, the summer. Then you have a section gyoji that looks at traditional celebrations. So things like Easter or Christmas would be in uh, that section. Then you have a section about animals and a section about plants. And uh, with, uh, for that specific example, uh, for the withered field, if you uh, looked in uh, the, the winter section of a haiku uh, and then uh, went into the, uh, the, I think it's in plants, uh, no, sorry, oh, I forgot. There's also a geography section of uh, things like landforms. So uh, you go to the landform section of winter and then you would see uh, the, all the season words uh, for uh, landforms uh, for uh, that season, you would find withered field. Uh, you'd see withered field as a head word, uh, which uh, I'll talk about a bit later, with a number of supplementary season words attached sometimes. Then there'll be a definition of what uh, the uh, season word actually means. In the larger 
Saijiki, you might even have a, a section on historical source criticism right after that. And then you have a list of uh, reiku or example haiku that are generally taken by the editors of the Saijiki to be the best representatives of the actual meaning. So uh, that's the way it would look if you opened up a Saijiki. Okay, good. Thank you. I looked at this picture. Uh, I was wondering if you were going to talk about the Kegel cat. Oh no, this is just uh, that's just a, a, a picture, so people uh, don't feel uh, completely overwhelmed with all the season word stuff. And uncharacteristically, she's being very well behaved and having a nap right now. Hello, this is John Stevenson. Um, I'm just wondering if um, within a group of season words, you know, you've said that, that some seasons are considered more poetic than others. Um, within the individual seasons, are early, late, or mid uh, season words considered more poetic or not? I'm not sure. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure. My, uh, I would have to look, but um, my uh, gut feeling is uh, if you have a season like spring, maybe late spring would be a little more poetic uh, because that's when you have the, uh, the, the cherries blooming. Uh, but uh, it may vary from season to season, but I'm not sure uh, I can really speak to that immediately. Yeah, and I think that some of the Japanese kigo, some Japanese uh, love that kigo. It's not only a poetic ones, but for example, like um, fire, firefly is favorable kigo for a lot of people. And some strange kigo, spring kigo, like um, something in the insect uh, cries or insect voice or something. So that there's obviously favorite kigo by poets, but it's kind of like a different era has a different favorite Kigo. So it used to be maybe more traditional one, but nowadays, you know, the people tend to change the taste and more modern ones are popular or something like that. But cherry blossoms, moon, um, fireflies, you know, those are like traditionally strong, favorable Kigo. That's from, um, Haiku belong to someone who belongs to the same haiku group with Philip, which run by Dr. Arima. Thank you. So I'm still very much a beginner. So the, I, I appreciate the support and the extra information. So I think I'm, there will be another break for questions. Uh, I'm going to get back to the uh, presentation if that's all right with everybody. So now I actually want to look at uh, the main point of this talk, which are the ways to end a season. Now, when you're looking at the transition from a one season to another, there are a lot of sets of season words that talk about that. Uh, but uh, in order to focus the talk better, and I went back and forth a lot over the past few weeks trying to decide what to include and what not to include, I thought it worked best if I restrict myself to three sets of season word concepts. And I say concepts because these are season word ideas that recur in different seasons. So the three I want to look at here are waiting for the next season, departing seasons, and regretting a season's passing. And uh, the, the, I'm just uh, listing them here. In uh, the summer, you have aki omatsu, waiting for autumn. In winter, Haru omatsu, waiting for spring. Then we have uh, another set of uh, the season words in spring, yuku haru, departing spring, and autumn, yuku aki, departing autumn. And then the last set uh, in spring, haru oshimu, regretting spring's passing, and aki oshimu in autumn, regretting autumn's passing. 
traditionally these sets of season word concepts are assigned to the seasons as shown above and i'm saying those are traditionally so you uh, don't find of uh, the waiting fours in spring and autumn uh, you traditionally have not found the departing ones and the regretting ones in summer and winter although things are changing and i will be talking about this at the end of the presentation but i want to present the traditional pattern first and I alluded to uh, this a little bit during uh, one of the, uh, the questions just now, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm focusing on head word season words in the Saijiki only as significant concepts. I'm not focusing immediately on the supplementary season words, which are called bodai in Japanese that are listed underneath the head word season words. And what I'm talking about is if you open a Japanese uh, Saijiki, the important seasonal topics or concepts will be, which are seasonal words, uh, will be listed in usually large type usually boldface, and those are considered to be the seasonal topics. Underneath that, uh, you will find a supplementary season words, and those season words sometimes are simply, uh, they can be uh, the synonyms. So for example, with uh, akikaze, uh, autumn wind, you will see akinokaze, uh, wind of autumn, as a supplementary season word. It, it's really a synonym of akikaze. But you will also find season words that are related but aren't quite quite established enough to be full topics themselves are listed as supplementary season words. And Saijiki do vary uh, on uh, how they classify season words. Uh, it really depends on what the editorial policies were of a given season word almanac, whether that season word almanac is meant for beginners, in which case the entries are very compressed, or where you have a, 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 a very large, very comprehensive uh, uh, season word almanac that has a lot more breakouts. So in order to uh, give some coherence to this, I focused on uh, using uh, two sets of uh, Saijiki, and these also happen to be the ones that I use every day. So if you can see my screen, this is the multi-volume Kadokawa Haiku Dai Saijiki, so one volume for each season. And also the newer, and by newer, this has just come out in the past couple of years. Uh, this is the large print edition because I'm because uh, the uh, uh, Karokawa uh, Haiku Saijiki, uh, again, one volume per season. And these are the ones that I use uh, pretty much every day for the uh, haiku practice. And just as a little note, because we're going to be, uh, I'm not trying to teach anybody Japanese in this uh, little talk, uh, but uh, just uh, for reference, Haru is spring, Natsu is summer, Aki is autumn, and Fuyu is winter. We will be seeing these words a lot. So let's start with Aki Omatsu. It's a summer season word meaning waiting for autumn. It's used at the very end of summer and this season word embodies a wish that autumn with its relief, with its cooling breezes will arrive soon. You're waiting expectantly for autumn uh, because the autumn means it's not gonna be summer and it's not gonna be so, so horribly hot anymore. Uh, it's an emotionally charged season word. There, this is a, there's a strong sense of expectation and of waiting impatiently in this. So again, it's a summer season word looking forward to autumn. And I have uh, two examples to share with you. One by uh, the haijin by the name of Hokko. I could not find this person's name in any of my uh, the haiku uh, the, uh, dictionaries or the reference works. Uh, I, I think he was probably an Edo period haijin, somebody before Meiji, just because of the, the way that uh, his uh, name is. Kaki no ki ni, aki machi gao no karasu kana. In the persimmon tree, a crow with the face of a waiting autumn. In the persimmon tree, a crow with the face of a waiting autumn. Uh, what's going on in this a haiku, a machigao, is a, literally a face that you make that makes people understand that you're waiting for someone. So a machigao, you're, you're, you're waiting for somebody, you can see it in your face. And here, the crow, you can see in the crow's face that the crow is waiting for autumn. A more modern one by Matsuura Keishin. Taisaku o shiage tsutsuaki maateori. While finishing my great work, waiting for autumn. While finishing my great work, 
waiting for autumn. I like this haiku because you see a overlaid on the process of working on some large, large scale work that's uh, close to coming to completion. You've also been living through a very, very long, very, very hot summer that's also coming to completion. So there's a sense of expectation in both cases. We have a parallel season word in the winter, which is haru omatsu, waiting for spring. And again, it's very parallel to uh, 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 aki omatsu, uh, waiting for autumn. Uh, again, uh, the spring uh, promises a relief from the bitter cold of winter. It promises new life. Uh, the season word looks toward a time of uh, more uh, happier activities, uh, wearing lighter spring clothing, going on spring outings, and uh, so forth. And again, this is an uh, emotionally loaded season word. So it's very parallel to uh, waiting for autumn. Uh, two more examples, one by Isa. Kuchi akete haru wo matsurang inu hariko. With open mouth, is it a waiting spring? Paper mache dog. With open mouth, is it a waiting spring? Paper mache dog. And a newer one well, from uh, the, the show up period by Saito Sanki. Shounen o eda ni tomarase harumatsuki. Bringing the boy to a halt with its branch, a tree waiting for spring bringing the boy to a halt with its branch, a tree waiting for spring. And again, you can feel in uh, the, the, both of these, the emotional substance of the season word. In the, uh, the Isa haiku, uh, you have uh, the Isa's uh, the own desire for uh, the spring to arrive uh, the projected uh, onto uh, the, uh, the, uh, the paper mache dog. In the Saito Sanki of the haiku, uh, you have I think a sense that both the boy and the tree are waiting for spring, uh, whether you take this as uh, the uh, boy is actually physically stopped uh, by the tree's branch, uh, or whether the boy is stopped because he notices the branch of the tree that looks like it's just about to come into bud, and that signals the new season coming. So I think they're both effective haiku. Do you wait for other seasons? And you don't really await for summer or winter. Or waiting for summer, at least as far as I found in my side, Jiki, does not exist as a season word. You don't wait for winter either in autumn. And uh, I think uh, the reasons are probably pretty obvious because summer and winter are the seasons of extremes. And if you're leaving spring and autumn, which are uh, mostly uh, the beneficent seasons, you're not really hoping for the next season to come. The second set of season words uh, I want to look at uh, are centered in actual uh, spring and autumn. And uh, the first concept I want to look at is, are the season words that incorporate the verb oshimu. And oshimu refers to the feeling that you have when you are aware that you are actively losing something that is good or that's important to you. Oshimu has other meanings as well, but the one that's specific to its use as a, as a, as a kigo is this. So haru oshimu means regretting the passing of spring. You, you could also maybe translate it as holding spring dear. You're cherishing spring so much you, you don't want it to go, even though you know it's going and you can't stop it. Again, it's another emotionally charged uh, season word. According to the uh, haiku dai saijiki, this concept of uh, the oshimu as applied to seasons uh, was uh, first showed up with uh, the flowers, hana, and the moon, tsuki, and then later on to spring and autumn. Uh, I'm not sure if in the Edo period or earlier, uh, uh, hana oshimu or tsuki oshimu were actually season words or not, or whether these were concepts that go back to uh, classical waka, uh, but uh, they do not exist as uh, season words uh, as such nowadays. And we don't have hana oshimu and tsuki oshimu as season words. We have haru oshimu and aki oshimu. So a couple of examples, one by Busong. Haru oshimu hito ya enoki ni kakurekeri. Kakurekeri, regretting spring's passing, 
a person hidden by a hackberry tree. Regretting spring's passing, a person hidden by a hackberry tree. And a 20th century example from Hino Sojo. Te o tomete haru o oshimeri tai pisuto. Te o tomete haru o oshimeri tai pisuto. Stopping her hands, she regrets spring's passing. Typist. Stopping her hands, she regrets spring's passing. Typist. And as I mentioned, a parallel to that, we have Aki Oshimu in autumn. And just as with Haru Oshimu regretting spring's passing, there is a feeling of loss that's uh, palpable here. Uh, you are saying goodbye to a season and that's not necessarily, there is a lot of melancholy involved with that, especially with autumn. So two more examples, one by Busan again. Aki Oshimu. Toni otozururu tanuki kana. And this can be read in two different ways. So, regretting autumn's passing, coming to call at the door, a tanuki or raccoon dog. Regretting, regretting autumn's passing, making a noise at the door, a tanuki. And tanuki raccoon dogs are very cute, but according to my uh, the Japanese Tai Chi instructor, they're also rather smelly. And uh, the, the here uh, we, you have this, uh, again, the sense that uh, autumn is leaving and who shows up at your door, it's a guest, it's a raccoon dog, a tanuki. A modern one by Kusumoto Kenkichi. Akiyoshimi oreba harukani machi no oto. As I regret the passing of autumn, the sounds of the city in the distance. As I regret the passing of autumn, the sounds of the city in the distance. My last set of uh, the season words about the uh, uh, ending of a season uh, are. Uh, season words that talk about uh, the season itself departing uh, uh, using the word yuku. So uh, our first example is a yuku haru, departing spring or passing spring. For uh, those of you who are uh, more familiar with Japanese, uh, yuku uh, in this case can be written in one of two ways, the way I have it written here, which is the standard way it's uh, recorded in the saijiki is the standard way that you write the verb yuku or iku meaning to go to leave. But you also find it written with a different uh, character that uh, has overtones of uh, passing away or of a person passing away. So you will find both. This season word idea also contains strong overtones of regret. So that Oshimu sense is still there, but this season word focuses more on the time aspect of the season's end. So Yukuharu looks at the season flowing onwards in time. We know it will return again, but it is flowing onwards. And uh, the reason I wanted to look at this as a set too, again, just to rephrase, in the Oshimu, the regret season words, the primary focus is the emotions you have as the season's passing. In the departing season words, the Yuku season words, the primary focus is on the actual passing of the seasons through time. Although we do have the, uh, the, the, uh, the other connotations coming in as secondary connotations. This is, this is a question of nuance. So uh, two examples. The Basho example comes from the Okuno Hosomichi, the uh, long journey to the north. Near the very beginning, at the point when Basho and Sora are saying goodbye to uh, the Basho's disciples and they're actually starting on their two-person uh, walk all the way up north. So the sense of this poem is not just departing spring, but also that the Basho and Sora are departing from their entourage. Yukuharuya, torinaki uo no mewa namida. Departing spring, birds crying fish's eyes full of tears. Departing spring, birds crying, fish's eyes full of tears. 
and a more modern one by uh, Usui Susumi, Yukuharu ya basho mo shiki mo tabi no hito. Departing spring, both basho and shiki were travelers. Departing spring, both basho and shiki were travelers. And again, I think you can feel that sense of a little, a little passing with that haiku. In parallel with uh, the other poetics season, we have Yukuaki, Departing Autumn. And uh, I don't want to repeat myself too much, so this has the same characteristics as a Departing Spring, although in the case of Autumn, there's a stronger sense of melancholy, uh, which is a characteristic of a late autumn. So, a haiku by Shiki. Yuku aki ya ware ni kaminashi hotoke nashi. Departing autumn, for me, no gods, no Buddhas. Departing autumn, for me, no gods, no Buddhas. And again, a more modern example by Ozawa Hekido. Yuku aki ya tsukue hanaruru hizagashira. Departing autumn, distant from my desk, my kneecaps. Departing autumn, distant from my desk, my kneecaps. So I'll have another quick break for questions here. If there are any questions about this uh, the second part of the presentation. Philip, could you tell me the name again of the author of the very last haiku you just read, the knee with the kneecaps? Uh, Ozawa Thank Hekido. Thank you. And I should mention that the translations of the haiku are mine, so they're the best that I could do, but if there are errors, I take a complete responsibility for them. So I think if there aren't any more questions, we will move on. I'm trying to not speak too quickly. So my apologies if it seems like I'm really rushing through this. So what I've done is I've presented the traditional distribution of these season words. We have the waiting for seasons in summer and winter. And we have the season words that talk about uh, regretting the passing of a season or the passing of a season in a melancholy way in spring and autumn. But do these season words occur in other seasons? And they, this is where it gets uh, interesting. There is a winter season word, toshi oshimu, which I didn't talk about with the, the earlier season words. Uh, it means regretting the passing of the year. It's a year end season word. And because of that, I didn't include it in my discussion of the season since we're looking at the totality of the year as opposed to an individual season word. But it does exist and it is a winter season word. Uh, I'm giving an example that I really wish were true for the, at least me this year because we're having a very eventful year, but. Uh, haiku by Morita Kimiko. Heibon ni sugitaru toshi o oshimikeri. Holding dear a year that has passed uneventfully. Holding dear a year that has passed uneventfully. And this is the sort of uh, uh, haiku personally that you know, I would have looked at in, in previous years and said, oh, that's kind of nice. But now, I don't know, it really kind of hits home for some reason. So what else is happening with these season words, the Oshima and the Yuku season words? Well, all of the Saijiki explicitly state in their descriptions of uh, Haru Oshimu and Aki Oshimu and uh, Yuku, uh, Aki and Yuku Haru that you do not say regretting the passing of summer. You do not say departing summer. Uh, they say that, but uh, Natsu Oshimu regretting the passing of summer and yukunatsu, departing summer, do appear as supplemental season words if you go on to the 
summer of uh, volume of uh, the Sajikian look under the, uh, the season word, uh, the header Natsu no Hate, end of summer. So they're not quite full-fledged of uh, the seasonal topics yet, but they do exist. People are starting to use them. People are writing about them. And you can see why that we have changing lifestyles. We no longer live in a pre-modern uh, agricultural uh, ambient. We have summer vacations, or whether you're an adult or a school child. People travel to uh, summer homes if uh, they're lucky enough by the mountains or by the water to avoid the heat. Uh, there are summer activities that people really enjoy now. So you can feel the regret at the passing of this and the returning to pretty much everyday workday life or everyday school life at the end of summer. So this is a place where the lifestyle changes are affecting how people are writing about haiku and uh, how uh, new season words are coming into being. And in the newer, the fifth edition of uh, Haiku Saijiki by uh, Karokawa, the, the summer volume, uh, this one, uh, it explicitly describes Natsu Oshimu as a new season word uh, because of this. So one example by Nagashima Yasuko, Yuku Natsu no Kura to Kura to no Aida Kana, Departing Summer, the space between storehouse and storehouse. Departing summer, the space between storehouse and storehouse. What about winter though? When we come to the winter, uh, when you look in the big uh, Haiku Daisai Jiki volume uh, for winter under the topic headword season word Fuyutsuku, winter comes to an end, you see Fuyu Oshimu regretting the passing of winter and Fuyuyuku, winter departs as supplementary season words. But the examples aren't as well attested as these new uses for summer. Uh, there's only one example of the haiku listed in the, in the big uh, the dai, uh, in the big haiku dai saijiki, uh, one, and that's for Fuyuyuku, Winter Departs, and it's a uh, haiku by Nakahara Michio. Fuyuyuku ni ka ten koru nado wa nashi. Winter Departs without a curtain call or anything similar. Winter Departs without a curtain call or anything similar. So it's not as well established as the uses of the new uses of these two season words uh, in summer. And when you look at the winter volume of the brand new fifth edition of the Haiku Saijiki, Fuyuku and Fuyu Oshimu uh, are not listed at all in any kind of way. They're not a season word, they're not a supplemental season word, they're just not in there. So uh, I find it interesting that with changes in modern lifestyle, we are starting to see a, an extension of these season word concepts to summer, but although it's still theoretically possible for winter, it's still not as well established or at least as a, well uh, attributed in the Saijiki uh, as uh, in winter as for summer. So just a, a few remarks in uh, conclusion. I wanted to look at this, these three cases, these uh, three sets of uh, parallel season words uh, to uh, explore some uh, larger ideas about season words in Japanese haiku. Uh, one of the points that I want to make looking at the way the, the, the system works is you can have multiple season words describing different nuances of the same larger seasonal topic. And that's true of both uh, the within a season and uh, the, the with uh, that that is especially true within a season. This is what makes season words poetic tools. I mean, uh, season words are not blunt instruments. Uh, there's a great deal of nuance involved, uh, especially when you get to the more lyrical, more poetic ones. Season words can also have parallels in other seasons, but the parallelism is not uh, completely uh, uh, mathematically identical. Uh, season words will have their own special patterns even when they occur in parallel. The three sets of season words in this uh, talk, as I mentioned, are highly poetic and they're very lyrical and uh, they either directly describe spring and autumn or they point towards spring and autumn. 
And I think this again is a reflection of the deeper poetic tradition's appreciation of those two seasons. And uh, lastly, uh, I wanted to uh, mention as uh, something that uh, is uh, continually impresses me and continually delights me that uh, the inventory of season words is not fixed. I mean, the, the, these uh, Saijiki are authoritative for a certain period of time, but things keep changing. New season words keep being recognized. Old season words pass away as uh, lifestyles change, uh, as uh, season words become popular or stop becoming popular. Sometimes old season words uh, get uh, revived. It's continually changing. It's, uh, it's, it's a living system because uh, as a haiku poets, so we're also alive and we're writing living poetry. So that's something that uh, continually delights me about learning about season words. This is not something that's set in stone that's never ever going to change. Uh, it's a uh, little continually in flux. I'm really to share that with and I'm really happy to share that with people. So thank you very much for listening to this. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone can feel free to unmute now. Philip, that was great. Thank you so much for giving us that presentation. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. Very inspiring. Lots of <laughs> ideas came out of that. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I'm just reading so much and I want to share with people. And it's, uh, uh, I kind of feel like as I'm reading, I should be telling people things, but I have limited opportunities to do that. Uh, the, one of the enjoyments that I have of working uh, as a, a beginner in Japanese haiku is just a little learning all of this and wanting to convey what I'm learning to people hopefully correctly. Well, those of us not fluent in Japanese are extremely oh, grateful. Well, who is who is good in Japanese are very, very impressive as well. Um, it's echoed, is it me? But anyway, um, it's it's very interesting and it's, it's you learned. I mean, you studied a lot very deeply. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Does somebody happen to have their telephone on at the same time as their computer? Because there's quite an echo going on. If there is, then maybe uh, mute that one. Okay. It's nice to have a refresher on the season words, you know, as you write for a period of time, you sort of slip away from them. And it's nice to kind of be pulled back to rem remember the depth of the season words that, uh, you know, us, us modern haiku writers that kind of, we drift a little little ways into our everyday modern life. And uh, it's good to kind of have that traditional hit and, and thoughts of uh, the beginning. Thank you. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Philip, first of all, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Um, but I was thinking about the feelings you talked about with the departing of autumn, um, the emotion behind it. And I have this season felt like, oh my gosh, I'm for the first time hoping autumn, we get through autumn and get into winter and get rain and, you know, just because of the fires. And I was wondering about that. I mean, that's such an unusual thing. I have never felt you know, well, just in the last couple of years, I've been feeling it when autumn comes. Oh my gosh, it's fire season. You know, that's different. And one of the things that really interests me by uh, learning about the Japanese tradition is as uh, the Western haiku writers, uh, if we are writing up uh, the types of haiku that uh, use uh, season words, this will help us inform our own understandings of our own system as it develops, uh, because of what we have on the central coast is going to eventually look different and our valuations of the seasons may be different, but understanding the granularity and uh, the way emotions work with the season words, I think, uh, helps us as uh, the English language language poets too. Thank you. Yeah. I've been leading Renku sessions on the Haiku Foundation's website for uh, several years. And these sessions involve people in both the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. So we have uh, had some interesting experiences in terms of trying to adjust our sense of 
of uh, Kigo. Uh, in particular, we do not, we try to avoid using um, uh, seasonal festivals that are attached to a particular date because they will be one season north and another season south. You know, I was reading about, uh, I guess the New York Times or Chronicle about smoke seasons. I thought we have a new Kigo of saying what Allison, what you're saying, that we smoke, we now have August to November is smoke season. So that's like t very specific to us in a way in the la last five years. I mean, smoke season used to be in the Bay Area. The fires would be, you know, maybe late September, early October, like the 91 fire, you know, was much later, but now our fire season's really changed. So our our experience has changed. When I'm writing a Japanese haiku about what's going on now, uh, I have to kind of be careful because uh, the, the, the concept, the season word, uh, fire, uh, kaji, and uh, yamakaji as an associated of a season word, meaning wildfire, are actually winter season words in Japan. Oh. So uh, I, I'm, when I try to write about this, I'm having to talk about the smoke or something like that, but not specifically talk about the fire. Uh, was fire related to burning the fields, like burning the rice fields? I wonder if that was a, a key go. Uh, it's uh, primarily people's uh, houses, uh, because again, if you think about the, uh, the, the long uh, the history of, of, of the season words uh, in winter, people are indoors, uh, they have uh, the, the portable heaters going, usually consisting of open flame. Uh, all it takes is somebody to knock something down. Yeah. Mm. Different lifestyle. Life yeah. changing. Well, this was wonderful. We really appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you. That yeah, was great, Phil. So really, nice, you Phil. Are. really, really. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you for listening. I'm tired of being the only one to listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our spouses are too. <laughs> but she's a haiku poet. <laughs> Any more questions for Phil? Have you thought have about question. writing it up, Philip, for Modern Haiku or Frog Pond? I know there's a lot of work, but I think it's it's really a wonderful piece, and it would oh. be nice to share. I know it's a lot of work to do that. Uh, I could think about it. I mean, I've been uh, giving uh, the talks this year uh, about uh, the season words and uh, their their deeper history or uh, just interesting things. So uh, earlier this year, I gave a talk about a series of season words to uh, Yuki Teike uh, that are about mountains uh, that go back to a Song Dynasty landscape poet's treatise about uh, how to actually uh, paint mountains. So I'm hoping that I'm still trying to narrow down the topic that I'm going to talk about at Asilomar this year, but I'm thinking that I'm going to try to write up uh, the, all three talks as something and uh, hopefully maybe get it published. So thank you. Philip, it's Diana. I'm interested in you giving a few examples about the new season words that you've noticed coming out. The more, you know, you were saying that Old ones are leaving, new ones are coming. Could you speak to that for a moment? Well, they, uh, the, the people's lives change. So in the, the, the latest uh, the Karokawa uh, Haiku Saiji Ki and the, the summer volume, uh, just as an example. It's wrapping up. Uh, the, the word uh, kampu, which means uh, camping, as in going camping, uh, uh, has been an established season word in uh, the Japanese for quite a while, uh, but in the, the new volume of the, 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 the Karokawa, uh, the, the summer of uh, the Saijiki, uh, you see the appearance of barbecue or barbecue. So uh, that's an example of a new season word. It's still a supplementary season word. It doesn't have uh, its own spot on the page, but it is listed. And uh, there are some things, some uh, words, there's, uh, I, I'm completely blanking on uh, her name now. There is a very famous uh, hygiene in Japan. She has uh, had columns in the, the NHK Haiku magazine and she has been leading the uh, haiku part of uh, the Purebato, which is a- Yeah, Natsuki, uh, Natsui Satsuki, uh, Natsui Itsuki. 
Thank you, Natsi Itsuki. She has a series of books about what she calls uh, endangered haiku, that is, uh, the haiku uh, that uh, are uh, the people don't write about anymore because they're not part of your daily experiences, like, say, kang kang bo, or the, the, the kind of uh, the straw boater. People don't walk down the streets wearing straw boaters anymore, unless they're cosplaying or something. So that's an example just of a season where that nobody writes about anymore because you don't wear it, you don't really see it. Yeah, that reminds me, when I first uh, started writing haiku in Japanese, Kyoko Tokutomi gave me a saijiki, old saijiki. She doesn't use it anymore, but unfortunately, it was published in the 1930s. So all those kigo, which, you know, don't, you know like uh, modern people don't use, it's still listed, a bunch of them. So as a beginner, I used them all because they were interesting kigo. And Dr. Rima said, Faye, Next time you come to Japan, go to bookstore and buy modern saijiki. Your choice of kigo is very, very strange. <laughs> so you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, and especially at the time, I'm the only one who lives outside Japan as a Tei member. Right now, we have some Chinese and first American or Canadian, I should say, like Philip or several people who lives outside Japan. But at that time, I was only one. So uh, I didn't know that <laughs> there's such a new Kigo and old Kigo. <laughs> so that's Kyoko's fault. <laughs> <laughs> And there are some saijiki too that are more traditional than others. Uh, so uh, the uh, Hototogisu group's uh, saijiki, which is uh, an updating of uh, Takahama Kyoshi's uh, original saijiki, is extremely traditional and uh, doesn't contain a lot of the words that you'd find in uh, most of the other modern saijiki by uh, other companies or other groups. Well, there's, uh, also, there's also I have like, a question. Does the Kiko have to be? Um, does the Kiko have to be in the first line always, or can no. it be in the second and third line? It can be anywhere in the poem, and uh, some poets will even take uh, a season <laughs> of Kiko and split it up, uh, and uh, they'll create a longer phrase out of it. Oh, okay. Thank you. That was helpful. But somehow, a lot of somehow. Japanese kigo um, is in five uh, syllables, um, so it's perfectly, five. you know, as the first five <laughs> or last five. First five. But it doesn't apply <laughs> for, for the English language. Sometimes you get long ones, and I'm still struggling because I really want to write a good haiku of the, of the season, the word tsurebe uh, otoshi. Uh, which refers, it's literally bucket drop. Uh, it refers to how quickly the sun sets in autumn. And suru de otoshi is six. Uh, and it's, people do, uh, people uh, use it in different ways. I'm not sure I'm skilled enough to use it, but one of my goals someday in life is to write a really good haiku with suru de otoshi as a kigo. Hmm. Well, this was very enjoyable. Thank you. Very informative. So now um, I'd like to just say, if anyone wants to go, this is a perfectly appropriate time to go. <laughs> if you want to stay around and chat, stick around. But I think the official meeting has ended. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was really wonderful to see all of you.